Good evening. Um, as you'll have gathered, I'm Robert Hodgson. I've been a member of Red R since 1980 when it was set up. Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming along to look at my holiday snaps. And I realise already that I've totally failed because I haven't any video. Um, it is a bit of an honour to be here. And I do hope we get some interesting discussion later because that's what I think these evenings should be about, is sharing... Uh, sharing and learning from each other. Um, and in particular, I should be interested to hear the MSF viewpoint in due course from John. Um, maybe we'll review it, what's the thing? Um, yes, this talk is very much more about old style engineering, basic wash stuff. Uh, which one? That one? No, which one is on it? Okay, um, this is a very brief outline of my assignment in terms of the chronology. Uh, I was in Sierra Leone between uh, beginning of, of November and mid-December as the lead wash for the Kerry Town Ebola Treatment Centre. I was originally approached by Save the Children, for whom I worked uh, in early October, and I tried to put them off by saying I wasn't available right now, and they said that's fine, actually, November would be great. So I spent the whole of October wondering whether actually I really wanted to do this. Um, but um, I did. I had three days training with the MSF in Brussels, and then I went on to Kerrytown. Uh, I arrived there just after it opened, and I left just before Christmas, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. A few facts about Ebola. We all know it's an extremely nasty disease if you catch it, um, and it kills a large number of the people who contract it. Uh, what I was very relieved to learn from MSF is it's actually quite hard to catch. Very unpleasant if you do, but very difficult to catch. It uh, requires exchange of body fluids. It could be blood, it could be saliva, it could be all sorts of things. Uh, and it doesn't survive very long outside of the host organisms. So basically, if you keep a metre and a half away from a sufferer, you're reasonably safe because you're out of range. And it's also very easily killed by chlorine and ultraviolet sunlight, things like that. So <clears throat> that was all very reassuring to me. Uh, and I felt much better by the time I got on the plane. Uh, this is an aerial view of the Kerry Town Ebola Treatment Centre, as it was at about the time I arrived, just as it opened. And as I say, it opened the day before I got there. Um, John will probably tell me that it's a very poor design. It wasn't designed by us. It was designed by the Ministry of Health, and it was built by British Royal Engineers. Um, a tremendous rush. So basically, I arrived as the setup team had got it set up and ready to go, and my job was to make it work for the next month so it could then settle down and, and do what it was meant to be doing. Um, <clears throat> briefly, the layout is uh, you've got two halves to this centre. This line of buildings here is the actual treatment centre itself where the Ebola patients go. And the rest of it is the support base. So we've got warehouses and offices and a pharmacy and changing rooms and things like that. Um, and we also had over here uh, a small extra treatment centre which was operated by a British Army field unit which was specifically for aid workers who had contracted Ebola. So if I caught it, that's where I would have gone. And the way this works is in theory, although it wasn't fully operating when I left, so it didn't get to this point until after I'd gone. Effectively, the patient comes in at this end, in, in the ambulance, and they're immediately screened, very basic screening, to check, is it likely to be Ebola? Because one of the difficulties with Ebola is that a very large number of other tropical diseases, including malaria, look very like Ebola uh, at first. 
So the first question really is, has this patient really got malaria and not Ebola? And, it, and so you check for a range of different symptoms that tell you it's Ebola, and if you have at least four of them, I think it is, then okay, you're in. But if, if, if in fact all you've got is a temperature, then it's probably malaria, and please will you exit through that door quick before you do catch it. Um, <laughs> and the next step is we take a blood sample, and you've got, it takes four hours, we have our own laboratory on site, so it takes four hours to get a feedback from that. And if the answer is positive, then you're in, and if it's not, then please go away and tell it either it is positive or and take this malaria pill and uh, hopefully hopefully that will sort you out. So at this point, <coughs> some, of, some of the people who come in will have left. Those who do have Ebola then go into the wards, uh, which were set up in this case with sort of progressively worse symptoms because depending on how different people catch Ebola in different ways. Um, and so these four wards here had the Ebola sufferers in. Um, and in effect, they moved in this direction. They either moved quite quickly to the morgue, at which point they were passed on to burial, or they recovered, which took some time, and came out to a door here. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, a couple of other points about this place. It needs a lot of water. You can see the water tanks here, which are up on the hill. And so, mostly, they gravity fed into the system. And again, I'll talk about that later. Um, well, that's, that's the layout of the place. It was very much a priority for all of us to make sure that the people who are helping to look after Ebola patients stayed safe. And a big part of that is getting the protective equipment, the PPE, correct. So we, by and large, followed the MSF system because that's where we learned it. And that involves complete covering from head to toe no skin is visible anywhere. Um, this picture shows, well, me in the middle. For some reason, this is a favorite picture with everybody, probably, because you can't actually see it's me. Um, some of you may know Mark Buttle, long time Red Arm member, who was my predecessor of Works for Save the Children. Uh, and then we had Jesus from Spain, Farouk from Pakistan, Michael from Kenya and William from Uganda. So these were all the international team leaders on my staff. And we had about, eventually about 300 national staff organized in five teams. Um, so Mark's looking happy because his job is to make sure that we're safe to go in the system. And once we are, he can go home, which he did. Um, putting on the PPE is the easy bit because you've got plenty of time, you can check yourself, you can see, can I check everything? Taking it off is much, much more tricky, because this is the point at which you are actually contaminated, or you may be, and we want any contamination to stay outside and not get on to the person who's undressing. And one of the most important people in this process is this guy here with the spray. As I say, uh, chlorine, Chlorinated water kills Ebola. So we, that spray has got a strong chlorine concentration in it, and every time this guy turns around, he gets sprayed. It's on the point at which he's in his normal clothes, which you can't spray it because they dissolve. Um, but essentially, this man's job is to take that guy through the process of, of disrobing in a safe way, step by step. And if you've been in there for an hour, you'll be very hot and sweaty inside that thing, and uh, you could easily miss bits out if you didn't have somebody very patient guiding you. I mean, that previous picture, I was only in the suit for about 10 minutes, and I took it, took off my, my suit, I think something like a cup full of water just, just ran out of the gloves when I took them off, and it just, just, just uh, filled up the ends of the gloves, and, and if you're in there for an hour, it gets much worse. You really are sweaty. And uh, you might be getting quite desperate because sometimes you can't breathe if, if your face mask clogs up and things like that. So this is an extremely important job. Probably the most important one. A large part of what I was doing was training up the extra people we needed to make, make this centre function. At the time I arrived, we had about 130, 140 local staff. 
uh, who, who were cleaners and all the things I'm going to describe. And that was enough to open it and to make sure we knew what we were doing. But to get it running at full capacity, which was, as I say, 80 beds on our side, we needed to double that number. And it takes a long time to train these guys because first we have a week or so of teaching them how to put the stuff on, making sure they can do it. And um, <clears throat> you have to remember that none of these people, none of my staff, had ever done anything like this before. At least the medical staff and the clinical staff knew about their particular profession, but these folks were, well, a lot of them were teachers, in fact. Um, we had a stockbroker amongst them, we had fishermen, we had farmers, we had all sorts. And uh, but one thing they had in common was none of them had ever worked in a hospital before. So we had to start by teaching them about PPE, and then we had to go through what their duties were going to be. And I think this picture summarizes a lot of what we taught them, which is basically every time you see anything dodgy, you spray it. I think the maxim we had was, if it moves, spray it. If it doesn't move, spray it again to make sure. And so that's, that's what these people are practicing. Um, and that was actually something that nobody, nobody really told me I was going to be doing when I set off, so it's like an extra duty. What does WASH mean? For those of you who aren't aware, WASH, the acronym WASH is Water and, Sanit Water Sanit Water and Sanitation and Hygiene Promotion. Um, and in the context of an Ebola treatment centre, it means everything that isn't handled by the clinical staff. So that's the list there, and as I already alluded, one of the biggest things is the dead body management at the end, which is a really difficult thing, and I'll talk, talk about that in a minute. Um, so I'll basically go through this list now, and try and show you what it really means. It's very difficult because I couldn't take pictures inside the hospital, uh, because there's a privacy, there's a privacy issue, and there's also a biosecurity issue. Once you take the camera in, it's got to stay in there, so you've never seen the pictures again. Um, <clears throat> we had about between 30 and 40 of our hygiene staff and about the same number of clinical staff on every shift going into the hospital. So that's between 60 and 80 people each six hours who all need boots, overalls, uh, goggles, in some cases gloves um, and, and aprons and things like that. And we had a team of people whose only job was to keep washing stuff, make, making sure we had a ready supply of um, all, all the reusable kit that we needed. Uh, not a very exciting job, but a very important one, like reckoning the wash people we're doing in this place. As I say, I can't take pictures couldn't take pictures inside the active wards, but this is one which wasn't at the time I arrived on the screen. So we used it for training purposes, and we, we experimented with different ways of laying out the beds and so on. And here you see Jesus demonstrating our new ideas for, for setting that. But basically, what our teams had to do was to make sure it stayed clean like this. Bearing in mind that an Ebola sufferer might be bleeding profusely, uh, might be sick regularly, and it's almost certainly got diarrhea. You can imagine that keeping a, a ward clean is not easy, especially when you're togged up in all that um, uh, PPE. Um, so we try to keep everything as simple as possible, easily wiped, wipeable surfaces, everything sort of out of the way where you know where it is. Um, everything that was consumed in the red zone had to be burnt because it could be contaminated uh, and that included a very large number of plastic suits. Um, I think towards the end we were burning something like 300 bags of waste a day uh, of which something like two-thirds to three-quarters was basically plastic suits, uh, these things here. Um, and this is one of the most dangerous operations we ran, really, because these incinerators were uh, 
proper clinical waste incinerators, and they were running it up to 1,000 degrees centigrade. So if you open the door at the wrong moment, you'd have a serious problem. Um, and it took a lot of training to get that message across that make sure the lights are out before you open the door. <coughs> you can see how hot the chimney is in this picture taken at night. The other problem with them was that um, the PPE, being lightweight, burns very inefficiently, and we were forever producing an awful lot of smoke, which uh, annoyed lots of people and was a bit of a bane of my life trying to work out what to do about it. As you can imagine, tinkering with the controls of a thing like this when you're in a, in a, in a space suit and it's about 35 degrees outside and rather hotter inside, it's, it's no fun, so you, know, it's, you can't spend a lot of time twitching things. You just sort of do a setting and see if it works and then try again later. And uh, we never really did get that right. A water supply. In fact, had two sets of chlorinated water supply lines. Um, we had, I can't remember which way around they were now. We had lot, one lot running at 0.5% chlorine, free chlorine, which is approximately a thousand times stronger than a swimming pool. And we had one lot running at 0.05%, which is about a hundred times stronger than a swimming pool. Put it this way, there was a lot of chlorine in the water. Um, and the strong stuff was used for cleaning, and the weaker stuff was used for hand washing, because we didn't want people to burn themselves when they washed their hands. <coughs> and that sounds fine, except that chlorine at these strengths is very bad for metallic taps, particularly bronze and brass ones. And we had an awful lot of leaks in our system, and we spent a lot of time tracking leaks and replacing metal taps and metal fittings with plastic ones. And we also put in an emergency water supply in case the leak happened somewhere where we couldn't get at it easily like underneath the floor. So these are all things which because because the place was built in such a rush people hadn't really thought through. So we had these guys here whose job it was to regularly uh, as each tank ran down connected they put it up and, and refill with chlorine while the other one was running, so they were forever switching around. Um, the other problem we had with water supply was the borehole, which was just nearby here, had not been very well developed, and the pumps, pumps kept basically breaking because they were full of sand and, and wore out quickly. It's very difficult to tell when a pump is wearing out because it just gets less and less efficient. And our, and you think all is well, and then suddenly you find the tanks are empty, which is a panicky moment. Until we learned to watch for that. Um, testing chlorine at that sort of concentration is really difficult too. Um, the standard pool chlorine tester is designed to test the standard pool strengths. Um, and therefore you have to, to, to test the strong stuff, you have to dilute it 1,000 times is really difficult to get accurate. So these, these guys are using a standard pool tester because it's all we have. You can get uh, test kits that will test stronger solutions, but you have to get them from Switzerland. And at the time I left, we hadn't managed to do that yet. And obviously, the strength of the chlorine is quite important and very reassuring to the people who are working in there. I don't want to come out and discover they're being sprayed down by somebody with clean water in their sprayer by mistake. So a major part of our work was making sure that we had the right chlorine solutions where they should be. In the wash business we have a saying, what goes in must come out. And um, we had septic tanks all around the place. Uh, and this is the one that was in the middle of the yard, in the green zone. I sh should say, of course, they're not really septic tanks because with all the chlorine about, nothing, was, they didn't work as septic tanks, they were really just holding tanks. But these were even worse than that because they didn't connect to the soapways because whoever put them in somehow didn't manage to make a connection. So after a week or two of looking at wet patches coming up in the middle of the yard, we thought we'd better do something about this and dug up and reconnected all the soapways. But 
that wasn't, I mean, that one was, was in the green zone. There was nothing particularly hazardous, hazardous about it that I haven't got in my own septic tank at home. The problem really was that none of these tanks had got the t pieces <coughs> on the outlet pipe, which is supposed to take the liquid in the tank from beneath all the floating stuff on the surface. And therefore, there was a strong risk that they would clog up the floaters in the tank. And I spotted this just before most of the upscaling happened. Um, and so we were able to fix most of these tanks fairly easily. But two of them were already in use in the Ebola uh, wards. And this is one of them. And uh, one of my more fun jobs was to work out how to get this thing retrofitted correctly when it's a live Ebola septic tank. <laughs> um, so this was the easy bit, spraying around the outside. These guys are just in the normal light PPE. But my job then was to come in with the, the full works on, stick the pump in there and pump into a hole nearby so that somebody else could go in and fit the bits on. Which we did, and it worked, but it was an exciting day or two. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I did think some one or two rude things about the people who built the tanks that weren't quite finished. Um, like I say, we had quite a lot of dead bodies to deal with at some point, at one point or another. Um, it's worth mentioning that at the point of death, the uh, the patient is at their most virulent in terms of the virus load. Uh, this, this, this little chart here is a sort of it's, it's indicative of the way the virus load in your body develops as, as the uh, disease proceeds. In fact, you've got about five to ten days here where nobody actually notices it. You've got no symptoms, you don't know you're ill, and at this point you start noticing a temperature and then you've got somewhere between one and three days while the, the virus suddenly peaks. And at this point, you either die or you start recovering. Um, and so if you start recovering, then you've probably got another three weeks or so before you're clear. I mean, everybody's different. That's sort of roughly how it goes. The point is that at the point when you die, you've got the absolute maximum uh, Ebola virus in your system that you could have. And therefore, the dead bodies are the most dangerous things you can, you can handle. Um, <clears throat> therefore, we went to some effort to try and make sure that people did it as safely as possible. And um, it's worth mentioning at this point too that um, you meet all sorts of people with interesting skills and experiences when you go on this kind of mission. Uh, we had, for example, a guy on site who had run a crematorium before, therefore knew something about incinerators, even if it wasn't exactly the sort we had. Certainly knew a lot more than I did. And we also had uh, a lady from, from University of London who is, so far as I can tell, the most expert person I've ever met on dead body management. There is nothing she doesn't know about collecting bodies from the street, from hospitals, from wherever they happen to be, and how to deal with them, and how to handle them, and how to put them into body bags, and what sort of body bags you use for different purposes, and different types of stretches, and it's just mind-blowing. And if you ever do meet Catherine, and she's sort of, sort of looking you up and down, she did once say, what she is thinking is, that's a four-man lift, or that's a two-man lift. <laughs> and when she told me this, I, I was amused. But then I discovered when I started doing a bit myself for real that, that you do have to know quickly whether you want two people or four people to pick up a body, because you can get into a bit of a mess if you haven't got enough. Um, but one of the things Catherine had done was to order these particular stretchers, which were not cheap, but they did make life a lot easier for moving the bodies around. She also showed us how you strap the body onto the stretcher by sticking the strap around, around the arms to, to stop, stop the body moving, and how to wrap up the body bags. And she also told us that we had 15,000 of the wrong type of body bag because that's apparently what the British Army normally uses. <laughs> and so <clears throat> we were a little bit short of these fully watertight ones, because obviously you need a fully watertight body bag in case the body leaks. You also have to fill it full of, full of chlorine for the same reason. And so all of this stuff we had to go through with our, our body movers. 
And there, John, um, I, I'm really, I mean, it's, as I say, one of the more stressful things we had to do, and it must have been doubly stressful for the, uh, for the local staff, because, of course, you, they never knew if it was, might be somebody they knew. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of that ever having been the case, but I can't believe it didn't happen. And that must be particularly difficult. But they were all extremely professional about it. Well, that was a rather morbid slide. This is the good one that follows. Um, if you remember back to that little chart, people died very quickly, and sometimes we had people dying as they arrived in the place because they were so near the end of that upsweep on the first bit of the curve, uh, because it did take a little while for people to get into the treatment centres. Um, but those who survived were still surviving sort of like three or four weeks later, and it wasn't until about a fortnight before I left that I realised that we were getting quite a lot of supplies because uh, I was doing wash stuff, I wasn't day-to-day -day treating people, so I wasn't sort of following who was still there. And suddenly we discovered that, that people were surviving and, and we were getting three or four releases each day. And, and that was suddenly an uplifting and exciting moment. And this guy here was one of the first, what we called survivors, but he actually was not a survivor at all because he never had it. Um, he came in with his mother, who undoubtedly did have it. Then we had the difficulty of keeping him inside the unit for 21 days and making sure he didn't get it, which is almost harder than looking after somebody who has had it and recovered. Um, especially as he was a very small child, and he had been breastfeeding, so which is a classic way of catching it. So we were, he was really lucky. Silla, this guy, represents all the wonderful Sierra Leoneans who have helped us to beat Ebola. After all, it was their country and they really took to it. And he was the guy who was, I think, pretty much responsible for this unit being where it was. He's one of the local headman committee in the area, which is like the town council, if you like. Um, he's the head teacher of the local secondary school. And he argued very strongly for bringing this centre to here. And he said the reason is because Kerrytown is historically a place of healing. Now, we foreigners all thought that Kerrytown was a place in Ireland. But it turns out <laughs> that Kerrytown is actually, in the local language, a place of the medicine men and healers. Uh, this place traditionally was where people from all over that part of Sierra Leone came if they needed some healing done. And Silla said, therefore, we should have it here. And his argument prepared. <coughs> Having done so, he then came in and got a job with, as one of our team leaders so that he could monitor what was happening inside and take back the messages and avoid all these problems that we read about in other places of, of mistrust between the community and the people inside. And, and he was a really wonderful asset to the whole, whole thing. And as I say, we had, by the time I left, about 260 other wonderful people working in, in, in the teams. So that was my farewell to Kerry Town. And I wouldn't want to finish leaving you with the thought that, that everything was gloom and despondency and terrible and horrible diseases and things. This is actually one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. This is the view from where we had breakfast. Uh, across, across the uh, Atlantic. Um, there was a little fishing village down the way where we got fresh fish every morning. It was a fantastic place and I only wish I had had more time to enjoy it. One day perhaps I'll go back for a holiday. Uh, I managed in six weeks to get two hours spare, otherwise it was 16 hours a day, which I've never actually done before, continuously like that. Even even when I tried to take an afternoon off, it turned out there was a meeting I was supposed to go to where I, where I had gone. But one morning, I did say I was going to take two hours off, and with Annie Lloyd, who some of you may or may not know, we swam to that island 950 metres away, which is considerably further than I've ever swam before in my life. Um, when I got back, I had to have two more hours off just to recover. <laughs> but um, it really... It, it was a surprisingly tough and full-on assignment, um, and I've done a number before, but they always seem to have had the odd weekend off, but this one never did. So, 
I hope I've covered everything that was in my notes. I haven't been checking. Um, no, I think that's it. Uh, I thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting. Um, and I hope perhaps it will inspire some of you to get stuck in because we folks are getting a bit long in the tooth, those who started where they are. <laughs> it's time for the young ones to come on. <laughs> Um, and it's been one of my ambitions for the last five or ten years to, to encourage new people. Um, so, that's what I'm going to say. Anyway, I think that's it. Any questions? I'm here.